Um, let's see, I'm gonna kill some lights here so that, uh, it's, I, this sounds loud even to me. Is this too loud for, for okay, fine, okay. Um, I'm gonna kill some lights here if I can remember how to do this. Okay, now, <clears throat> usually if I do this in one of my classes, within five minutes half the students are asleep, but I promise not to, uh, to try to put you to sleep on this one. Now, now this, uh, I was actually asked to do this in light of some of the recent events that have happened just in the last few months. I mean, we're only in May of 2010 and there've already been some, uh, some interesting major disasters. Now this actually, this photograph here behind the, this uh, in the title is actually from Iceland, actually not even from all that long ago. Um, and we'll actually talk a bit about Iceland and some of the other recent events, in fact, right now, just to sort of open things up. Uh, now, Iceland's eruption, recent eruption, that as, as far as anybody knows, has sort of died off just as of a few days ago, and flights to Europe have started to continue. Um, it, uh, it's actually one of these sort of, you know, almost unusual volcanic events uh, that wind up causing, as we already know, sort of a major disaster in terms of air travel to Europe, uh, economic troubles for Europe, and probably further economic problems for Iceland, which is already suffering from uh, the latest economic collapse. Uh, the, uh, now, this has got this funny name to it that uh, nobody can ever pronounce, so I'm going to give it a shot here, which is uh, Eyjafjallajökull. Yokel. Okay? And Eyjafjallajökull is actually the name of the volcano. Yokel is the glacier that it actually sits underneath. So a lot of times you're seeing it in the news as the Eyjafjallajökull uh, uh, volcano, but it's a actually the Eyjafjallajökull volcano itself. Uh, even before that, we also saw these devastating earthquakes uh, in Haiti. Uh, which was about a magnitude 7.0 in uh, January, and then followed not that long afterwards by this really big earthquake in Chile. Uh, the one in Haiti was, when you look at the magnitude, now magnitudes are usually what they're called logarithmic. You, know, you go up by one, that means you go up by a factor of 10 in size, factor of 30 in energy, and the Haiti earthquake is about 500 times less powerful than the one in Chile, but wound up causing many, many more deaths, over 200,000 deaths in Haiti, whereas there were maybe 500 uh, as of last count in Chile alone, okay? So it doesn't always have to do with the size of the earthquake that winds up causing the most amount of devastation. <clears throat> now, what we're gonna sort of talk about is whether or not these things are unusual. And so one of the questions I've often had, just in fact following the Chile earthquake, is from a student, not from one of my classes, but from a student uh, elsewhere that asked, whether or not these are related, whether or not the Haiti earthquake caused a Chile earthquake and whatnot. Um, and in fact, at the time that I was even asked to give this lecture, this was before the Iceland eruption even happened. So, um, so it's a lucky thing that I decided to talk about volcanoes today as well. But um, one of the points, one of the questions is whether or not 2010 is extraordinary. And the answer is no, okay? I mean, I hate to disappoint anybody to think that maybe this year is special, but it isn't really because these events, earthquakes and volcanoes happen all the time. Okay, and in fact, this diagram that you're seeing here, sort of a crude diagram, is actually, I just downloaded it from the U.S. Geological Survey today, about an hour ago. This shows uh, what earthquakes have occurred in the last seven days alone, okay? Um, and in fact, this earthquake here was in the northern Mariana Islands about two hours ago, okay? Which is when I downloaded this. So red means about an hour ago. Uh, just before I left home, okay? There was about a 7.2 followed by other aftershocks. This blue means um, uh, actually just about a day ago, but just around Thursday, there was a pretty big one in Vanuatu, which is down here, okay? And um, you can see these earthquakes occurring all over the place, okay? Chile continues to have aftershocks and reverberations even months later. Okay, so again, that's just from today, and if anybody wants that website, you're more than welcome to it. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to talk about today is a bit of the science that goes behind this. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the gory detail. In fact, I'm only going to talk about earthquakes and volcanoes. I teach a class called Natural Disasters, and we do everything from hurricanes, climate change, meteorite impacts, and earthquakes and volcanoes, okay? But I'm not going to do everything, all right? So first of all, there's some things I want to relay uh, without going into, you know, lots and lots of gory detail is, is just the concepts that allow us to say something about where we know these events to occur and what's the nature of these events, okay, that while they're not individually predictable, we can certainly learn a lot and, and have learned a lot to be able to say where you should avoid living, what type of building uh, standards you should have that are very rarely met, especially in developing countries. Um, and so what we'll go through is first of all talk about why we have these at all. What's the fuel 
uh, for these natural disasters, that the Earth is mobile. Obviously, it's mobile. We see volcanoes and earthquakes occurring all the time. Uh, plate tectonics is really the basic concept that's sometimes called the grand unifying theory of, of Earth science, okay? And it explains almost everything. And if we know something about that, then we can know a lot about earthquakes and volcanoes, where they occur, and what kinds they're going to be. So why earthquakes are not the same, same with volcanoes, and then we'll wrap it up, okay? And so we have quite a bit of material to go through. But now, I often begin my classes talking about the beginning of the universe itself, which is relevant. Uh, but since I only have an hour, I'm going to skip the first 10 billion years uh, and jump straight to the last 5 billion years, which I'll do in one slide. Um, so about 5 billion years ago, we know that the solar system more or less came together uh, and the Earth accreted. And in fact, that process is pretty fast. It only takes place over a few you know, tens of millions of years to form a planet. Um, and in fact, they come together by just sort of the glomming together and collisions of rocks and dust particles uh, through various stages. And we won't have to go into all of that. But the most important point from this is that all the energy from the collisions that happens from these planets coming together winds up being deposited inside our planet as heat. Just because, you know, you know that you've often seen movies when a, you know, a meteorite, this is a huge one, of course, but anything winds up hitting the Earth. It winds up hitting with so much energy, it winds up igniting oxygen in the rocks and stuff like that. And it winds up putting out a lot of heat that gets buried inside the Earth. And this is a form of heat called primordial heat, meaning ancient heat that's still inside the Earth. And the basic point is that the Earth is still cooling to space. It's a big planet and it's rocky and it moves very, very slowly and it takes a really long time for it to cool off the space. And it's going to take another, you know, several, you know, maybe 10 billion years before it loses all its heat. So all that heat that was stored from those collisions is actually eventually cooling off to the colder space. So the Earth is actually putting out through the surface about 40 terawatts. Now, and I'm not going to actually throw numbers around too much in this talk, but this is just to give you an idea. You know, you've got a 100 watt light bulb, okay, 40 terawatts is 40 trillion watts. Okay, so that's a trillion 40 watt light bulbs. Okay, that's spread more or less around the Earth, sort of. Okay, it's actually coming up in various spots here and there. It also is being generated by decay of, ele of, of elements like uranium and thorium. So it's about half and half. About half of it's coming from what was stored from collisions, about half from the decay of these elements. This is the fuel for geologic hazards. Now, you might think that number is big, but what is it that we receive from the sun okay, every day we get about 170,000 terawatts, so about okay, 4,000 times the amount of energy comes to us from the sun as is leaking out from the inside of the earth. And this actually goes quite far in explaining why hurricanes happen every season. And hurricanes, in fact, are far more damaging in terms of just total net damage because earthquakes will happen every 10 hundred years or so in a given spot. Okay, but hurricanes happen, I'm sorry, earthquakes will happen not that often. The hurricanes, of course, will happen about every year and cause a lot of damage. So this actually goes quite far in explaining it just in terms of the fuel that actually powers these things. But I'm not going to go into hurricanes other than just to raise this point. Now, one last thing is you may think this 40 trillion watts is big, but to give you a sense of it, if I were to take that power output and I were to you know, put it as light bulbs, okay, 100 watt light bulbs all over the surface of the earth, okay, just distributed evenly, it would be about two light bulbs per football field, okay, it's not much, it would barely light up, it wouldn't even light up a stadium, you couldn't read by it, okay, so that's not as much as you think, but it's enough to power these geological disasters. So what actually makes things move? If things are cooling off, that's fine, Okay, but what makes a move is convection. I mean, convection is something that I spend a lot of time studying. It's one of those very basic ideas that drives the Earth's interior, the atmosphere, the sun, the oceans, all this stuff. So it's one of these universal concepts, and it's not hard to understand. It's that hot stuff goes up and the cold stuff goes down, okay? Hot stuff is light, cold stuff's heavy, okay? The hot stuff rises, the cold stuff falls. That's all you have to really, all you need to know. Well, this also happens to occur in the mantle. Now you can get an example of this by just looking at your cup of coffee next time you have one and put a little cream in it and don't stir it. Okay? Eventually you'll see the cup of coffee convecting because the cold stuff on the surface is sinking. If you just leave it alone, you'll eventually see cool little polygons forming in your cream. I promise you it will work. Don't stir it, just pour it in slowly, let it sit. You'll see little shapes and stuff forming and that's actually convection occurring. Now in the Earth's mantle, which is this about 3,000 kilometers, about 1,800 miles thick layer of rock between the crust and the core, okay, this sort of reddish thing here, uh, 
is it's solid rock. A lot of times people think it's molten, that's the only way it can move, but it's not. It's solid, and it's solid and moves in the same way that glaciers move. In fact, glass even flows over long enough periods of time. Okay, and the stuff near the surface is cold and it sinks. The stuff near the bottom is hot, is heated up by the core and it rises. Okay, and, the, and this whole mantle convects okay, very slowly. This is sort of a computer simulation showing the blue stuff is cold going down, sort of you know, dripping and flowing all over the core. The hot stuff is rising and bobbing up, which is the yellow stuff. Now it moves very slowly, so I have your one to 10 centimeters a year. That doesn't give you much of a concept of it, but it's about as fast as your fingernails grow. Okay, I know you can't sit there and watch your fingernails grow, okay? or at least I hope you're not doing it right now. All right? um, okay? But you know they grow, right? so you know that it happens, or hair growth or things like that. All right? So it's about as fast as your fingernails grow. All right, so plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is the form of convection okay, in the mantle but that we see at the surface. Okay, and I'm going to go over this in a little bit. I'm going to try to beat this into your head a little bit because this is sort of one of the underlying concepts to explain much about earthquakes and volcanoes, okay, which is that you have the earth is divided up into plates, but you've got what's called big subduct, subducting slabs, or these are big tectonic plates that are the surface cold part of the mantle that get cold as they move away from where they first are formed. They get cold, and they get cold enough, and they eventually sink into the mantle. Okay? So again, they're formed here where they're hot. They eventually move off. Say this one moves off to the right. It gets cold enough and eventually sinks. That's a form of this convection. Okay? It just it's cold and heavy. Okay? And as it winds up sinking, it winds up pulling these plates behind it, sometimes ripping these plates open. Okay? So we're seeing this a bit in Iceland. Okay? Uh, and there are various, you know, there's some variations to this. But again, I'll beat this into your head a little bit. So the most important part in a way of understanding these things are the types of boundaries we see uh, from plates. Now, in a way, we can focus mostly on what's the big monster plate, which is the Pacific plate. The Pacific plate moves pretty fast. It's about 10 centimeters a year, which is one of the fastest ones. Okay, and it's diving off here towards Japan, and that's called the Kuril Trench. Okay, and it's moving in this direction. Where it's ramming in towards Asia is called convergence, and that's where things are subducting. It's also subducting underneath Alaska and the Aleutian Trench. So wherever we see a deep sea trench, that's where the plates are diving into the mantle, like here. Okay? Where they are pulling apart okay, are called mid-ocean uh, spreading centers okay, or mid-ocean ridges. This is called the East Pacific Rise. Off the coast of where we are is the Mid-Atlantic Rise, where the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are pulling apart from each other pretty slowly. Okay, but the Pacific plate is moving off in that direction. It's pulling apart from here, which is called a spreading center or divergence, ramming into here where it's converging. And on the side is quite the quite famous, what's called transform or strike slip fault, where things are moving you know, side by side with each other is the San Andreas fault, which is a kind of a big messy fault, but it's one of the most famous ones. Okay? Now here's a close-up of what we can expect. Again, I'm just driving this into your head. There's a subduction zone again. Things dive into the mantle. Spreading centers where things pull apart transform faults where they slide by one another. Now the nature of these different types of boundaries tell us a lot about the kinds of earthquakes and volcanoes that we'll get. Okay, so um, okay, earthquakes and volcanoes, first of all, occur almost exclusively, not entirely, but, but very much, almost 90, more than 90% of them occur on plate boundaries. And this is actually a sort of a count, okay, a location of earthquakes and volcanoes around the globe, and you'll see that they more or less outline all the boundaries of the plates. Okay? Uh, there's some exceptions like Hawaii here okay? um, and a few others here, here and there, okay? and we'll talk about those. Right? Um, let's see, I actually wanted to go back one. No, that's okay, we're fine. Okay, um, so what is an earthquake? Okay? An earthquake is where we have plates on either side, way off at a distance, are moving relative to each other, like a plate here is moving off in the direction of that arrow, and the other one is moving differently. So this could be, for example, the Pacific plate moving off to the north, and the North American plate moving or staying stationary or moving south. Okay, and they pull and they pull and they pull, and the rock somewhere around here gets bent, okay, uh, where it's sort of vaguely weak, and eventually uh, the stresses build up in it that it winds up snapping and breaking, okay, like it was if you were going to take a pencil and bend it and bend it and bend it, and eventually it will break. Okay, so eventually it will break, and you could take the pencil you know, at, a, at a distance and bend it, and it's your fists that, or your hands that are bending it, but it's going to break somewhere in the middle. Once they, they break and the blocks basically rebound, they basically 
uh, bounce, you know, one bounces forward, the other bounces the other direction. They wind up moving rock, okay, ahead of it, out of the way, and they wind up uh, moving it very rapidly and sending waves out, sending all types of seismic waves. Now, I'm not going to go into the different kinds of waves. There are ones that are like sound waves, like you're hearing now, and there are waves that are like waves on a string. And the waves that are go like waves on a string that go side to side, okay, in the earth, they wind up being the most damaging with regard to buildings, because big, tall buildings stand, you know, high up. Sometimes there's a parking garage underneath it, and the wave going side to side just takes the legs out from, from the building, and it collapses. Okay. Um, so what are the different types of earthquakes at plate boundaries that we can expect? Okay, there are spreading centers, and this is to give you a sort of a rule of thumb about what we're going to look at next, what we can expect from different kinds of earthquakes, and even volcanoes. Spreading centers are thin, they're hot, they're weak, they're under tension, so I'm pulling them apart, okay, and I wind up getting small earthquakes. In fact, so small that they're not dangerous, and no one really cares about them. Transform faults, this is sort of, you know, all in one diagram, the San Andreas is a better example. They're moderately strong, moderately cold, okay, uh, and they wind up having moderate sized earthquakes. I always like to give my students from California a hard time because they complain about the number of earthquakes in California. It's rare you get over a 7.0. People who live with the 9.0s, like in uh, Chile, they have something to really worry about. Okay, subduction zones are those types. The, uh, the crust or the part of this, the earth is cold, okay, it's strong, it's under compression, things are being rammed together, and when they break, they break in a big way, okay, they wind up generating big earthquakes. So where it's hot, you get not much. Where it's intermediate, you get moderate-sized earthquakes. And where things are ramming together, they're cold, thick, and strong, you wind up getting big earthquakes. Okay? These are where the monster earthquakes come from. So uh, sort of quickly going over some of these transform boundaries, because in the US, this is of particular significance, because, of course, California is the most populous state, and it also happens to be uh, sitting on one of the most active boundaries okay, on the planet. Okay. Um, however, over you know 100 or more years of earthquakes, California has developed excellent building codes. So, even decent-sized earthquakes on the San Andreas tend not to cause an enormous amount of damage and destruction like you often see elsewhere. So, of course, one of the most famous earthquakes that's occurred in in in, in California on the San Andreas Fault is the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, which in a way was sort of the birth of of understanding seismology. In fact, you know, the Chinese in, 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 in times BC were, were actually studying earthquakes and had rudimentary seismometers, okay? But um, so, so uh, San Francisco in 1906 was home for about 400,000 people, nothing like it is today. There was an intense ground shaking. The amount of fatalities were not enormous, okay? Except for the fact that it was not a, a huge population. What actually caused most of the damage Okay, and this is one of those things that gives you a clue about building codes, is that, the, uh, is that gas lines were broken, which caused fires to set, be set off. Water lines were broken, which meant you couldn't put the fires out. So a lot of the destruction in San Francisco was due to fires being set off uh, after that destruction. Presently, the San Andreas Fault, it's a complicated, messy fault. It's not one fault. It's actually a braided fault. It just has tons of them. But the San Andreas is the main one. And just to give you a sense of it, the present, the, the 1906 section is currently locked, meaning basically it's locked up and it's very hard to move, which means it's actually prime for a, possibly another earthquake. There's an area south of it that actually it's called creeping. It basically always has a ton of little earthquakes on it and it has no trouble moving. And then there's these areas down here towards Los Angeles, San Bernardino, which are locked again. And what happens is that when a fault like this is bent, it winds up becoming difficult to move. Okay, it doesn't slide side by side, it winds up being bent and gets jammed up and locked. Okay? Uh, so one of the more famous ones that have, has occurred in California is of course the Loma Prieta or the World Series, Series earthquake, since it occurred during the World Series at the time. Um, that was again not an enormous earthquake, a magnitude 6.9. People remember this because of the collapse of, there was really damage in two main areas, the Marina District and in this Interstate 880, with ser several layers of the uh, of this freeway wind up pancaking or collapsing onto each other, and about 40 people or so were killed. Um, and this is interesting, in fact, that the, where the most of the damage occurred was where a lot of these structures were built on, on soft sediments and, in fact, rubble left over from the 1906 earthquake. So what happened in these areas, although building codes elsewhere are pretty good, when the earthquake happened, these areas shook because they were sitting on soft, uh, rubbly you know, muds and, and sediments. Uh, an example that's often raised as something that might possibly happen in Los Angeles, 
people often worry in Los Angeles about the thing called the Big Bend, which is that lock zone that I showed you around San Bernardino, is the, uh, the Kobe earthquake okay, in 1995. Uh, on the Nojima Fault. Uh, this is sort of one of these spectacular photographs where this entire freeway got tipped over to its side. Uh, again, it's about a 7.0 earthquake uh, with a bunch of you know, aftershocks. Uh, but again, this wound up actually causing a significant number of fatalities due to building codes that were not quite ready for this, and obviously including building of freeways. Okay? Haiti is, of course, one that we most uh, are concerned with most recently. Uh, because, of course, it just happened a few months ago, and people want to know more about it. And it's actually quite an interesting earthquake. First of all, Haiti, uh, and in fact, the whole island of Hispaniola, so there's the Dominican Republic connected to it, it actually sits <clears throat> on the boundary of the Caribbean plate. Okay? It's a little tiny plate uh, that, well, of course, sits off in the Caribbean. And the Caribbean plate is sort of moving off. Uh, well, it's actually the Atlantic is moving to the west. But it subducts right underneath here. And we're going to come back to these and look at volcanoes on this side of the eastern Caribbean later. But right along here, you can see the plates move side to side. And a close-up of it shows that there are two main faults that bound the island of Hispaniola. And Haiti and Port-au-Prince is right around here. Okay? There is the Enriquillo Fault and the Septentrional Fault okay, up here. And these are both, again, strike-slip faults like the San Andreas, much smaller. Okay? And as we all know, on January the 12th, there occurred the 7-point earthquake, which unfortunately occurred only about 10 miles away from Port-au-Prince. Okay, which is actually one of the reasons it caused a lot of damage. But what also caused a lot of damage is the fact that there were very poor building codes. Okay? For an earthquake that was not enormous, okay, uh, it wound up causing over 200,000 deaths in the end okay, because of the fact that there were just shoddy building codes elsewhere. And this often happens, we find, when earthquakes occur uh, in Turkey, in Pakistan, okay, that you have moderate-sized earthquakes that wind up causing a lot of fatalities, mostly because of of poor construction or preparation beforehand. So this is a before and after of the presidential palace, okay, uh, streets of Port-au-Prince that were, of course, decimated by this. Now, one of the, th the things to be aware of, and certainly the government in Haiti and, and, and uh, uh, reparation efforts have to be aware of, is the likelihood of another earthquake occurring there. Uh, there is a, you know, in terms of predicting earthquakes, there's a thing called seismic gap theory, which basically says that if I have a big earthquake here, but a dearth of earthquakes on the same fault, it probably means there's stress building up where there's not enough earthquakes. If you have a lot of little earthquakes, it's, it's, it's a good thing. But if you have a big earthquake, but then it winds up building stress up on this fault, it's likely that another earthquake will occur there. And in fact, it is likely that another earthquake will occur on the Enriquillo Fault in this area on Hispaniola probably within the next, at least within the next 100 years, which is about as good a prediction as you can get. It may happen sooner. Okay, and this is actually a, a prediction of the stress buildup on that area. Okay, so let's move on and talk about subduction zone earthquakes. These are the big monsters. Okay, subduction zone earthquakes, again, I'll remind you, this is where the whole strong coal part of the upper part of the earth is coal strong. It's being rammed into a continent, usually. Okay, so there's collision zones. And it's very hard for it to bend and break. And when it does, it breaks in a big way. And this is when you wind up getting these monster earthquakes, like the one that happened in Chile not that long ago. Chile, in fact, is known for, not that far from the one that happened recently, is known for having the biggest recorded earthquake of a 9.5. Okay, 9.5 is enormous. Okay, uh, so the 8.8 .8 that happened a while ago, that's almost a whole factor of 10 weaker, not quite, maybe a factor of 7 weaker, okay, than the one that happened in 1960. And the Sumatra Andaman earthquake also occurred then. So to remind you, most of these earthquakes occur around the Pacific Plate. The Pacific Plate's moving this direction. You have the Aleutians, all through here in Japan. Okay, this is where a lot of the earthquakes, these big earthquakes occur. But over here in Chile is where another plate, which is not shown, is called the Nazca Plate, it's diving up against or ramming up against South America. And you get those here too. And this is often called the Ring of Fire. Many times you've seen a reference to the thing called the Ring of Fire. These are actually surround all the subduction zones that go around uh, the Earth, except, of course, the San Andreas right here. So all along the Pacific, this is where the Nazca plate dives up and rams up against South America. Now, when a subduction zone earthquake happens, it's a little different than what happens in a transform fault, but a similar idea that as I have this slab trying to sink into the mantle, the crust above it winds up being locked on this blue zone and bending, almost like if you were imagining a crossbow or a bow and arrow. Okay? If I was bending this big plate, bending it down, eventually the stress is built up enough that it unbends and pops up. 
Okay, and when it pops up, of course, it causes an enormous earthquake, but it can also wind up generating tsunamis. So here's a little example of the dashed line here is before it pops up, afterwards it pops up and hoists this big mound of water out up that winds up sending tsunamis out. It's like, you know, ripples in a pond, but very, very, very big ripples. Okay, so some examples of this are uh, classic ones, like in Alaska in 1946, there was about a 9.2 earthquake, which I listed before, and it wound up generating an enormous tsunami. And to give you a sense of the power of it, this is a, basically a solid cement lighthouse, uh, Scotch Gap in the Aleutian Islands, before and after, basically after there is nothing. Okay? There were several workers in the lighthouse that were killed from about a 30 something high, 30 meter, which is about 100 feet high tsunami, that immediately hit this because it was, there was no warning time. This probably hit within you know, a minute of the actual earthquake occurring. Um, that wound up wiping out this lighthouse entirely. And then it continued to move across the Pacific and killed about 160 people uh, in Hawaii from the tsunami itself, not from the earthquake, but from, from the tsunami, okay, that then continued to move on across the Pacific. Okay, we saw an example of this when the Chile earthquake happened. People in Hawaii were worried about a tsunami hitting there as well. This is actually what, you know, an example of, of, yeah, of a tsunami coming up on the, sh up on the, on the port of Hilo. This is from Hilo itself. And a tsunami does not typically look like some big giant breaking wave that you might surf, okay? Uh, unless you're an idiot, okay? Um, right? Uh, but it typically winds up looking like a flood. And this is a lot of times why people have referred to it in the past as a tidal wave because it looks like a rapidly rising tide. It has nothing to do with tides, okay? But in the background you can see this big bore, big white water, rolling bore of water coming up onto the streets of Hilo and everybody trying to get away from it. Okay, in 1960, there was this massive earthquake um, that uh, also wound up generating a huge tsunami as well that wound up rushing across the Pacific. By this time, uh, the people in Hawaii were prepared. There had already started to be the establishment of warning centers, um, but it also wound up continuing on and killing about you know, almost 200 people in Japan itself. So again, this was the biggest recorded earthquake uh, that's happened. Now, this is an example of, of again, poor Hilo. Hilo is in a, in a narrow bay, so when a tsunami hits it, it winds up amplifying the waves, uh, and Hilo got whacked again in 1960, and you can see the power of this, of this is, you know, knocking over, you know, from that distance is knocking over a parking meter, okay? Um, and, of course, just a few years ago, there was this devastating earthquake that occurred in uh, Indonesia, in the, in the, it's called the Sumatra Andaman Island earthquake that then generated the Indian Ocean tsunami. This is a bizarre earthquake in that it was very slow and it's probably, it took several years to figure out how big it was. The first estimates of it were around eight point something and eventually it's been moved up to about a 9.3. It's possibly the second biggest earthquake recorded. Okay, so at the time, even from this slide, it's thought, people thought it was the fourth largest, but even just within the last year or so, it's been moved up. It was a 1,200 kilometer rip in the earth that actually tore for seven minutes, which is one of the reasons why it was hard to figure out how big it was. It wasn't like a big pop, okay? It was actually a giant tear in the earth, okay? And it happened about uh, 30 kilometers at depth, which actually raised the seafloor about 20 meters and generated this enormous tsunami, okay? Now this is a, a, a sort of a, a, a movie or a calculation of what the tsunami would have looked like as it was racing across <coughs> the Indian Ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and what's interesting, of course, is that the deeper the water, the faster these things move. So you actually will see that this wave wound up hitting Sri Lanka and India at about the same time it hit Thailand. Now these waves move very fast. Okay, they move about as fast as a jet plane moves. They move about 500 miles an hour. Okay, when they're going across deep water. As they're going into shallow water, they move much more slowly, but they also wind up building up an amplitude. Okay, they wind up getting steeper as they go into shallow water, especially coming up on shore. Okay, so this is an example. This is the Bande Ache, which is on the tip of Sumatra. This is a before and an after of this community that got inundated by this 100 meter high tsunami. Basically, the whole community was erased entirely. Um, since there are kids in the audience, I'm skipping over that one. And, um, this just shows an example of, of uh, sometimes the people are silly enough to, when a tsunami comes, sometimes the wave doesn't come first, the ocean draws out. And people think, well, all the seafloor is exposed, I'm going to go out and look at the fish and the clams and stuff like that that are exposed on, on this. And they literally do run out, and a lot of fatalities are due to that, people going out and looking at this exposed seafloor, and then the tsunami, the wave itself comes back in and they can't get away in time. A lot of times people hear a tsunami's coming, <clears throat> I lived in Hawaii, <clears throat> 
before coming here for 10 years, and when there were tsunami warnings, people used to rush down to Waikiki Beach to see it coming, which is not the smartest thing you could do, okay? Um, <clears throat> and a lot of fatalities in the early tsunamis from 40, 1946 and 60 were due to that. Uh, so Chile, in, just recently in February, uh, I'll make sure I have enough time to go over volcano, so I'll be almost done here. Uh, Chile is located over the subduction zone, the Nazca plate, diving into, again, into the mantle beneath South America. The recent earthquake occurred just off the coast. Here is Santiago, okay, which is the capital of Chile, and it didn't occur, it occurred not that far away, right? Um, so, of course, it wound up causing enormous damage, uh, but a surprising, surprisingly few fatalities, about 500, a little over 500 fatalities last count. Um, this occurred about, you know, these are just some numbers, about 200 miles away from Santiago, um, about 70 miles away from Concepcion, okay? Um, and in fact, this down here, this big circle here, is the, the location of the 1960 earthquake, okay? Down here, and this is the current one. So it didn't occur that far away from that monster earthquake that occurred in 1960. Okay, this is an example of sort of the direction of the, or this is really like the wave amplitude, the height of the wave and the tsunami that was generated by this, and it wound up sending these, you know, it doesn't just come out as simple little ripples in a pond. Because of the, the shape of the seafloor, it winds up sometimes sending out, looks like, almost like beams, okay? In fact, San Diego did get some damage, okay? But this beam notice just missed Hawaii. So Hawaii was on call and preparation for a big tsunami to hit, but it wound up missing it, okay? But it did wind up causing damage. Of course, all the way down the coast in Chile, okay, there were tsunami damage from this one earthquake just recently. So let's do volcanoes next, okay? We have a little time. Uh, I love this movie. There's a great, this website here has some, I mean, this, this is a photographer who somehow manages to go around and, fi and film and photograph volcanoes all over the world and I've decided I want his job, okay? Um, okay, uh, so this is actually from Montserrat and uh, actually recently I took a class from my natural disasters class to the Caribbean, and I'll show you some photos of that um, in a little bit. And, um, the, uh, and in fact, in between the time when I went to scope out the islands we wanted to go to and when we went back, Montserrat exploded. And in fact, sort of eliminated our chances of seeing Montserrat, which I had hoped to see. Um, we'll see more of that later. So like earthquakes, volcanoes occur mostly on plate boundaries. Okay, not all of them, but most of them. Okay, and the magma, the types of lava that comes up in the eruption style, uh, depends a lot on that type of plate boundary, just as it is with earthquakes. Okay, so for example, mid-ocean ridges where things are pulling apart, okay, it winds up drawing mass up from the mantle, okay, this heavy mantle, okay, uh, and as it winds up drawing this mass up, the release of pressure winds up allowing that stuff to melt. It's not that it gets hotter, it's that you wind up taking some pressure off the stuff that's coming up, and the release of pressure causes this thing to melt, and it comes up into these mid-ocean ridges and creates a lot of volcanism. Okay, that we just don't happen to care about that much. Okay, uh, this mantle rock is dense and it's full of, full of metals. Okay, metals like iron and magnesium and some calcium. And that sort of heavy concentration of metals makes that lava very runny, very low viscosity. Okay, what's called basaltic magma. You've probably heard the word basalt. Okay, so basaltic magma is very runny. All right. Um, on the seafloor, mid-ocean ridges, since they're out on the bottom, we don't tend to see very much of them. Actually, most of the production of magma happens at seafloors. About 80% of it actually happens at these mid-ocean ridges, okay? But it just happens to come out in a very slow, oozing fashion, nothing explosive, it's very runny, it just spills out. And it winds up spilling out in what's called pillow basalts. And sometimes you can see movies of these pillow basalts inflating like balloons, okay? They're not explosive, okay? Um, and so we didn't, I won't even mention them ever again, okay? Um, <laughs> Well, maybe at another class I'll mention them again, but not to you. Okay. Um, so there are non-plate tectonic volcanoes. Hawaii is the classic example, which do not occur on plate boundaries, and they're worth mentioning. This is thought to be what's called a hot spot uh, or an intraplate uh, volcano, where there is a hot spot in the mantle. Okay, and there are a lot of debates about what causes these. People like myself think they're caused by a hot upwelling in the mantle, what's sometimes called a mantle plume. That, that rises up and eventually burns a hole or melts a hole in the crust. Remember, this Pacific plate is moving off here towards Japan, and as it moves off, it's, be, it's ha having a hole burnt in it, and you wind up developing this island chain. The whole state of Hawaii is right here, but the whole Hawaiian chain goes all the way out here to Midway. Then, then because the plate was moving to the north, 
you know, more than 50 million years ago, there's called the emperor chain. It's all part of the same hotspot. Okay, so it's called, sometimes called the Hawaiian emperor seamount chain. Okay, all together. All right, so these also wind up drawing stuff up from the mantle. It's the same material. Okay, it's metal rich and it makes thin, runny, basaltic lava. Okay, so as an example, here's me. Okay, playing with lava. It's one of the favorite things to do in Hawaii. Okay, I'm taking a, I'm poking this lava with a stick. And you can see it dripping and running, okay? Um, it is hot and painful to play with, but okay. Um, but it's worth it, all right? It's one of those things you just gotta try. Um, so when lava comes out first, it actually has a lot of water in it, or some water. When it first comes out, it winds up coming out. And these look like they're explosive, but they're nothing compared to the explosivity of the really big earthquakes like St. Helens, Mount Pinatubo, okay? These only go up about maybe a kilometer, okay? They look big, but they're not that big, but they're impressive because they're hot and glowing. Okay, so the gas comes out first and it's blowing these things out in what's called fire fountains and fire curtains. After the gas is all gone, the lava continues to spill out and makes rivers, lava tubes, lava lakes, things like this. Because it's very runny, the types of volcanoes it builds are called shield volcanoes. Mauna Loa is actually one of the biggest volcanoes on the planet, but when you're standing in Hawaii looking at it, it doesn't look that impressive. Okay, but it is massive because it goes all the way to the seafloor. Right? So uh, that's a typical type of volcano you see, it's a shield volcano. Now to talk about some events, just to do a little storytelling, uh, we'll talk about a couple, all right, with regard to Hawaii in particular, and also Iceland. Um, so during, in 1790, there was actually a sort of a freak eruption that wound up having a big influence uh, politically at the time with regard to King Kamehameha's wars of unification. King Kamehameha, some of you may know, was the first king that Captain Cook uh, actually came across, and Kamehameha actually used European mercenaries to help him win the war of unification. And at the time, he was fighting this uh, King Keoa, who was uh, for dominance on the big island, and Keoa was, had an army marching to meet Kamehameha's army, uh, but there was a freak blast in Kilauea that actually wound up being due to water building up inside of a crater, and the water superheated and exploded and wind up wiping out most of Keoa's army uh, in this sort of blast of ash and gas. Not so dissimilar to what's happening in Hawaii, in, in Iceland now, but over you know, months as opposed to one freak blast. So this actually wound up tipping the scales in Kamehameha's favor, and he went on to continue to be the king of all of the Hawaiian islands. Okay, and if you go to Hawaii, in theory, there are still footprints from these soldiers in the, in the Kau Desert. Okay. Um, when I moved to Hawaii, I was, like I mentioned, I was a professor there, and I moved as a young assistant professor in 1990, well, pretty young. Um, and uh, at the time we were moving, there was uh, flows coming from Kilauea that were inundating uh, the community of Kalapana. Kalapana was an actual, not a huge community, but a community with a golf course, at one time a golf course. And this lava from the Kapayanaha eruption wound up flowing down and running over Kalapana, and it continues to run over Kalapana even, to, even today. So this is actually flow going literally over a, a, uh, a park, okay? Um, and at that time, this is just to show you how fast these areas fill up with lava. This is a little mom and pop shop in April of 1990, okay, before the inundation. By June, okay, most of the building was gone, okay? So the roof had been taken off, so it was probably up to about this level, okay? And just a week later, just one week later, the lava had filled up to the base of the sign, okay? All right, so these are some USGS guys standing out there. So this is the same sign as here, all right? Uh, again, I took a class in 2008 to Hawaii and we went out to the Kalapana flows and this is when I, you saw the picture of me sticking the, sticking the, uh, the lava with a stick. Uh, this is about when we went to it, so this is a Yale class staring at some burning lava. And it was, uh, it was impressive because there were, you can see the steam coming from here. There is live lava flowing under this. I had to remind our students when you see a crack in the lava, please don't all gather up over the top of it, okay? It's not gonna hold you. Um, they were so enthralled with this. But somebody's shoes actually melted. Um, only one, okay? And um, Kalapana today is now famous for its ocean entry. Uh, this is actually a photo from our trip, but you continue to see lava pouring into the sea, and it creates, these gases actually are more than just steam. It's actually creating hydrochloric gas, because of course it's got salt that winds up being superheated and, and wind up forming hydrochlorics clouds that you definitely don't want to breathe. Um, so uh, AF Yala Yoko, the one that just, we think, ended a little while ago. I'll mention a bit of this. Uh, so we've all seen quite a bit in the news about this. Uh, Iceland is a funny volcano. It's both a hotspot and at a mid-ocean ridge. This is where the North Atlantic Plate and the Eurasian Plate are pulling apart from each other. 
Okay, so you actually get volcanism all the way along this ridge, but it's also a, a hot spot in the mantle that actually makes this anomalously or unusually hot, and, and that's what actually causes it to be sort of a little, a, a big island. Okay, so in, uh, <coughs> when the eruption, <coughs> excuse me, first started in March, it was actually, <coughs> get a little water here. So when it started in March, it was actually typical of these types of, uh, of runny lavas that would occur. Uh, and you would wind up ca causing fissure eruptions, which you also see in Hawaii, of this lava pouring out. You can see it sort of flooding the plains here. Okay? Um, the, uh, there were some local evacuations. This is not generally considered a very dangerous uh, type of eruption, other than if it winds up melting glacial waters and causing floods, which in uh, Iceland are called yokelhups. Okay? Uh, and those sometimes can be very damaging. Um, but what was really most damaging is when it entered the second phase of explosive eruption, which was sort of unusual, um, from about eight, April 14th to about now, okay, it's still sort of rumbling along. Uh, the water from the glaciers wound up flowing back into the crater, superheating, and it's actually the water that winds up driving the explosion. It also winds up cooling the magma and creating very small glass particles that wind up getting lofted into this eruption to create this ash. So it's actually this ash is made of, of a lot of very fine scale basalt glassy particles, which is of course one of the reasons you don't want to fly into it in an airplane, but you don't want to fly into any volcanic ash in an airplane because it completely will choke up the engines. Uh, so again, it's mostly due to glacial waters flowing in and not so dissimilar from that erupt, that freak eruption that wind up giving some favor to King Kamehameha in 1790. Okay, a water-driven eruption. There's a name for it, it's called a phreatic eruption, and these often occur. Okay, this eruption happened to waft about nine kilometers up into the atmosphere, which is quite high, okay? But it just so happened that the jet stream goes right over Iceland, okay? So it wind up ejecting this ash directly into the jet stream, which wound up dragging it all the way over to Northern Europe. So this here is a satellite image, okay, of the ash being dragged across the North Atlantic towards the European coast. Okay, so it was a bad combination of things of this having occurred under a glacier where the glacial water caused explosions and happened to be sitting right underneath the jet stream which then dragged it off uh, to northern Europe. Okay, what about, what, what, what worries uh, geophysicists and volcanologists is not so much this one but is the much bigger volcano that is right next door to it. AF Yala is this little glacier right here, right next to it is this big glacier and a much more massive volcano called Katla. And Katla has historically exploded following the Afyala eruptions in the past. Afyala has erupted before in like 1823, okay, it erupted and Katla erupted in a big way right after that. So the big concern that Iceland and Northern Europe have to prepare for is that Katla is actually quite likely to blow uh, in the possibly near future, probably within the next few years. Okay, so this is, this is something that's quite important, okay. Um, so let me move on to talk about, finally, about um, subduction zones, okay? Volcanism, which are the big monster types of volcanoes. These are the most violent uh, and the most deadly of all volcanoes, and they again occur at subduction zones. So notice the recurring theme, the subduction zones where the cold stuff sinks into the mantle is where there are the biggest earthquakes, and they also happen to have the biggest volcanoes. Okay, so what happens? This is a little more complicated than just pulling stuff up from the mantle and having it melt, okay? That's, the, that's easy relative for Hawaiian and mid-ocean ridges and Iceland, okay? For subduction zones, what happens is that you've got uh, seafloor sediments and crust that are loaded with water. They get dragged down into the mantle and the hot mantle cooks the water out, okay, right around here, and the water winds up seeping into this hot mantle rock, and because that mantle rock gets wet, it melts. Once you wet, make something wet, it actually melts more easily. That melt then percolates up through the crust, and on the way up, it winds up being contaminated, reacting, if you want, with crustal rock, which is rich in silica. Now, when I say silica, that's things like glass, okay, sand, okay, quartz. That's pure silica, okay? So I mix it with things like that, and I will wind up getting more buoyant rock, and lavas made from that rock are very sludgy, okay? So when I take that melted mantle and I contaminate it with silica-rich crustal rock, by the time it comes up, it creates these volcanoes, but that type of lava tends to be very, very sticky and pasty, and it winds up creating these sticky lava domes, okay? Here, if it's a little less silica-rich, it winds up creating things like Montserrat. These don't flow nearly as fast as Hawaiian lavas, okay, but they kind of tumble and roll, okay? But the really gooey, sticky ones will just wind up oozing out and forming these lava domes until they explode. 
But since they are loaded with water, remember I said they're caused by all this water being cooked off, okay, because they're loaded with water, bubbles come out, and the bubble pressure, the gas pressure, builds and builds okay, until it's actually able to unplug and break and pop open these volcanoes. And when it does, the pressures are so huge it explodes in a big way most of the time. Okay? So the types of explosive eruptions you see <clears throat> are called volcanian, which are just brief burps. Okay? They shoot up pretty high. The Plinian eruptions are the big monster eruptions. They continue for hours and sometimes you know, a day or, or more. Okay? Um, and then calderas are really enormous but rare. After these Plinian eruptions empty out the magma chamber, you got this big empty hole in the ground and it collapses and winds up spewing out even more magma. Okay? And so you get uh, uh, you know, various you know, calderas that occur, but they're pretty rare. Okay? Now, let's just focus on these Plinian eruptions. These Plinian eruptions are uh, named after Pliny the Younger, who wound up observing Mount Vesuvius, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, again, they're driven by gas bubbles coming out and spewing, and basically popping open the volcano and spewing out all this hot ash everywhere. It, they do not come out inside of oozing lavas. They come out in these massive okay, plumes of ash, okay, hot ash. Uh, these ashes, these ash, you know, ejecta wind up going 10, sometimes even almost 50 kilometers up into the atmosphere. They wind up shooting particles up into the stratosphere that wind up sometimes causing changes in climate. In fact, after Pinatubo, there was a distinct drop in global temperatures, and this is Mount Pinatubo, okay, in 1991. Okay, this shot up about 20 kilometers up into the atmosphere. This is one from the Aleutian Islands that sh shoot, shoots up so high, it actually also sends a shock wave out that pushes away the clouds around it. What happens after these, uh, you get these giant plenty eruptions, eventually this ash cools off and collapses. Sometimes the eruption doesn't go straight up, it just comes straight out the side. But this is an example of fact, Pinatubo, after this giant column of ash cooled off and collapsed, it creates a thing called pyroclastic flow. Pyro meaning fire, clastic meaning broken shards, okay? And so you get these almost avalanches of very, very hot ash that wind up swooping down onto the ground and traveling very, very fast, you know, somewhere around 300 uh, kilometers an hour, okay? So here's an example of Pinatuba. There's no way that truck is going more than 300 kilometers an hour, okay? Um, so uh, the another, that, that's one of the bigger dangers, okay? One of the things that causes massive uh, destruction are these pyroclastic flows. Another one are lahars. Lahars are when these, uh, the, the hot ash mixes with water or melts glacial waters and creates this pasty mix of ash and water that's almost like cement, but coming down steep slopes, okay, you've seen when you pour cement, it pours very quickly, but once it settles, it sort of settles and becomes hard. Well, a similar thing happens here. It flows very quickly, sometimes 50 kilometers an hour, okay, and it can wind up overrunning you know, areas, obviously you know, communities that sometimes are built up in near rivers. And in 1985, there was this, uh, one of the biggest volcanic disasters, about 20,000 people were killed in Nevada del Ruiz in Colombia. Um, from this lahar, this, you know, this, this flood of, of cement ash uh, mix that wound up burying this entire village. There's very few buildings left afterwards. Some classic structures you will see from these types of explosive volcanoes are called uh, stratovolcanoes for reaching up very high. Very, uh, you know, Mount Fuji is a classic one. This is Mount St. Helens before it exploded. Uh, Mount Mayon, yeah, these are some of the more very, very typical classical shapes of volcanoes. So let's talk about a few events, and then we'll probably be close to done. So first of all, the most famous one, of course, is uh, the destruction of Pompeii by the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 okay, uh, AD, CE. And in this particular case, the eruption wound up destroying Pompeii uh, by a pyroclastic flow. Now, a lot of times the image is that, that Pompeii had many, many people in it. In fact, the truth is they had a pretty good idea that this was going to erupt, and they did evacuate most of Pompeii. One of the reasons archaeologists find so few bodies in Pompeii is that most of the city was evacuated. So it wasn't nearly as big a disaster uh, in terms of loss of life as is often portrayed. Herculaneum, the nearby city, was also destroyed by a lahar that followed afterwards. And Pom Pompeii, I mean, uh, uh, Vesuvius has continued to be active uh, you know, for hundreds of years afterwards. And one of the bigger disasters was about, you know, in about 1630, about 4,000 people were killed in a, yet another eruption of, of Vesuvius. Um, one of the biggest disasters in history with regard to volcanic destruction was Tambora, the destruction of Tambora, uh, which is in Indonesia here, okay, so 
Uh, here's Australia. Tambora is right around here. Okay, so Tambora uh, wound up having several massive plinian eruptions that shot 43 kilometers high into the atmosphere. Just, you know, just to have you a, a, an idea that the top of the tropo tropopause, where the cloud deck is, is about 10 kilometers. Okay, so it's way up into the atmosphere. Okay, and there were several of these, and the pyroclastic flows wind up killing about 10,000 and wiped out two kingdoms of, of Sangar and Tambora. Okay, the pyroclastic flows wind up wiping out crops that wind up killing another 100,000 from famine, and the Plinian eruptions wind up causing global cooling, and it's rather famous as a year without a summer of 1816. Okay, so this is actually a recent image of Tambora itself, and this is Tambora, it's quite a sightly looking volcano. Uh, Krakatau in Indonesia is another classic example uh, of one in which there was an eruption and then collapse of the whole island into the caldera. Okay, that wound up, again, uh, you know, killing a large number of people. The pyroclastic flows actually wound up traveling, so this is Krakatau, in the Sunda Strait between Sumatra okay, uh, okay, and, uh, and, and Jakarta. Okay, and so the, um, I'm sorry, Java. And, um, and so the pyroclastic flow actually wound up traveling across the Sunda Strait and wound up killing about 2,000 people just on the coast of Sumatra. The resulting tsunami that wound up hitting Java and Sumatra uh, wound up reaching 35 meters, over 100 feet high, um, killing another 36,000 people. Okay? So these things can be massive, and what they wind up generating you know, not just pyroclastic flows, but by, by this collapse of this island, wound up generating a tsunami that wound up causing even more destruction. Caribbean volcanoes are one I'm going to bring up because we were just there recently, and they're fascinating, and it's got one of the best volcanic stories around, uh, which I have to tell quickly. Um, uh, so the Caribbean, of course, is we all know where the Caribbean is, just south of here, and many of you have vacationed there, of course. Uh, not sure how many have vacationed in Martinique, but Martinique is the, the, one of the, the sites of one of the most famous and deadly eruptions, which is the, uh, the eruption of Mont Pelee. Pele, in fact, is named after the Hawaiian god Pele, which is ironic because Pele and lavas are actually, or, or Hawaiian lavas are not very deadly. But Mount Pele uh, erupted in 1902, and one of the fascinating stories about this is that it, it, you know, it's, it's famous for having wiped out the town of Saint Pierre. Uh, but Saint Pierre, in fact, knew about this eruption. In fact, the indications of this eruption were happening at least a month ahead of time. But what's famous about it is sort of the political stupidity that the governor of Martinique insisted that there be no evacuations of Saint Pierre because there was a very close election going on between sort of the radical party and the party of sort of white plantation owners and he was worried about losing power and wouldn't let anybody evacuate from there. Meanwhile, the city was being inundated by ash. There was a destruction of a sugar factory by a lahar, by a mud flow. At one point, the ash flow wound up driving snakes out of the woods called pit vipers or fer de lance that invaded the city, wound up killing people. So the city itself was invaded by snakes. And the crazy story is that feral cats from the city came uh, <clears throat> storming out into the, into the town and battled the snakes uh, and wind up killing the snakes along with the soldiers. So it's this crazy sort of apocalyptic uh, vision of what happened. And then around, uh, around May 8th, uh, the eruption itself occurred. And in this particular case, the blast was out of the side of the crater itself. It didn't go straight up. It came shot directly out of the side of the top of the crater uh, a little lake called Etonsec that wound up heading directly for St. Pierre. St. Pierre was hit within a minute of, these, of this hot uh, ash cloud that literally nuked the city. I mean, it looks, this is what the city looked like. It used to be a, a big, thriving city. Uh, the town was obliterated down to the stumps okay, of, of this, and 30,000 people were killed, largely because people were, also there was a propaganda that St. Pierre was safer than elsewhere in the vicinity, so surrounding villages came into St. Pierre, populations from surrounding villages came into St. Pierre for safety, so actually swelled the population before it was wiped out. There were only two survivors, uh, and one of them was this prisoner who was sort of locked up in the bottom of a cell. There's a myth that he was a murderer, but it's probably not true. He was probably there for, like, petty theft. Um, but he wound up getting a job for Barnum and Bailey, which then had this to, to pump up the story, made it sound like he was someone on death row getting waited to be executed, and then this eruption occurred. So a lot of the history has been mangled by Barnum and Bailey. Um, <clears throat> this is actually an image of um, when we were just there a couple of months ago, uh, Mont Pelé in the background of, of what is St. Pierre today. These are still ruins of St. Pierre. Um, 
And uh, we actually marched up and, and, and hiked up to the peak of, of St. Pierre. And there's a dome inside this that you can't see from here because it's often covered in clouds. But there's an extra dome inside there, which is itself a pretty big mountain that was literally built in about three years. Yeah, it's an amazing thing to walk on a mountain that was built in three years, and from 1902 to 1905. <clears throat> Montserrat uh, is the most active of Caribbean volcanoes, and um, it has been erupting since uh, 1995. Okay, and this is a little flow that comes down. It's a great picture um, of this sort of tumbling flow that winds up incinerating everything around it and sending off this, this, this burning ash. Um, and in fact, as I mentioned in January, this is when these eruptions started to occur, uh, is when the last eruption happened in between our two trips there. Um, <clears throat> then uh, there's Dominica, which is one of the islands we went to. Uh, Dominica is probably the site of the most likely future disasters in the Caribbean. Uh, in fact, when people look at hazard assessments of the Caribbean, Dominica is always considered number one of future hazards. Whereas most volcanoes in the Caribbean have one volcano each, like Martinique has Mont Pelee, okay, one active volcano. Dominica has nine, okay, has nine active volcanoes, a lot of them in the south part of the island. Okay, we were here, this is our trip, hiking here, what's called the Valley of Desolation in the Boiling Lake. And it really, this is the Valley of Desolation, there's boiling mud pits behind it, and there is a whole lake that literally is boiling, I mean really boiling. Okay, and this is Scott's Head, which is actually a failed crater, which is a beautiful place to dive in, which is right here on the tip. Okay. Um, and then finally, my last volcano, of course, is, uh, is Mount St. Helens. Okay, Mount St. Helens, uh, within sort of U.S. volcanoes, is probably one of the most famous ones. 19, the 1980 eruption, and I happened to have actually been driving when I was in college through that area just after the eruption, which is, which is amazing to see the number of cars come in with this horrible ash all over it. Um, the, uh, it was about a nine hour duration, shot ash up 20 kilometers into the atmosphere, but it was also, again, like St. Pierre, a side blast. First there was a collapse, and then a side blast that wiped out most of the forests uh, just off uh, to, the, to the east of it, okay? Um, and lately, in about, from about 2004 to 2008, activity has started again, and there is a new dome built inside this crater, um, much like the dome that we hiked up on St. Uh, Mont Pelee just, just about a month ago or so. So in summary, to close out, okay, uh, first of all, the message I want to get across is that geological activity is really due to that, the fact that the Earth is just cooling to space. But it winds up, that cooling drives plate tectonics, which explains a lot of what we understand about these disasters, okay, that these, most of these things occur on plate tectonic boundaries. Okay, the nature of those boundaries tells us a lot, first, where these things occur and what types of disasters they're likely to be. And the big message is that where there is subduction, where there are the coal stuff diving into the mantle is actually where there are the biggest earthquakes and the biggest volcanoes. And at that, I will stop. Thank you very much.